All right, folks. Well, how was your weekend? You know, it rained a little, but at least I'm not Vladimir Putin. Okay, so let's cut right to the chase. This is sort of a impromptu, improvised, unscripted video about what we just saw happening in Russia recently. And I know the thumbnail says coup de blat, and in reality, this was more of a mutiny than a coup d'etat. But come on, coup de blat, it's right there. And in my video when I left for Ukraine, I stupidly did not seize upon the term Blitzkrieg to describe the Russian offensive. And I got called out for it, and so I don't want to make that mistake again. So yes, it's not a coup d'etat. It's really more of a mutiny and a failed one at that. Okay, but let's just dive right into what we know. So basically what happened over the weekend is... Yevgeny Prigozhin, who is basically the owner of the Wagner terrorist group, so-called PMC, he had been making a lot of strong statements against the Russian high command, specifically Minister of Defense Shoigu. And suffice it to say, he was not very happy at all. And what happened was he made a very interesting statement in which he basically admitted the truth about the war in Ukraine. He admitted that, no, the Ukrainians weren't bombing Donbass for eight years, and that there wasn't some increase in attacks on the uh, occupied areas of Ukraine or anything like that. He basically... <laughs> let the whole cat out of the bag, right? But then the story as he tells it is that his guys were planning to return their vehicles and I guess some other equipment to their storage depots in rostov na Donu. And rostov na Donu, by the way, is basically the big supply hub of the Russian military in the south, uh, not just in the Russo-Ukrainian war, and I'm talking back to 2014, but I'm also talking about the Georgian war and the Chechen wars. It's basically the headquarters of Russia's Southern Military District, and it is a very important place, especially now in this conflict. And they said that as they were heading back to just return their equipment and vehicles to the Ministry of Defense, uh, they were attacked by Russian military units. And there was a video posted that was supposedly the aftermath of a rocket attack on one of their positions. I cannot tell you how authentic it is. What I saw didn't look that realistic. But the thing is, we don't really see enough context to make that judgment. We don't know what they were supposedly attacked with. So, apparently after they were attacked first, Wagner troops rolled into rostov na Donu and they took over the... I believe they took over an air base, as they claimed, and they took over the headquarters of the Southern Military District. They were able to do this basically without firing a shot. rostov na Donu is a major Russian city. It's actually the first city I ever visited in Russia. This is not a small town. It's kind of funny that Wagner, with all the help of the Russian Ministry of Defense, had to fight street by street to get through Bakhmut, this small town in Ukraine, losing tens of thousands of guys in the process. And then they just rolled right into rostov na Donu and captured the headquarters of the Russian Southern Military District. They began issuing a lot of uh, tough big boy statements about what they wanted to see. They wanted Shoigu and Gerasimov gone. And rather quickly, they assembled a convoy and started driving towards Moscow. And I was actually kind of surprised by that because this is not a good strategy. Their best strategy would have been to sit tight in Rostov, fortify the area, grab every little bit of supply that's come in there that's sitting at the railheads and stuff like that, and try to force their demands. And their demands seem to have been that they wanted to retain their autonomy as a, air quotes, PMC, and they wanted to see Shoigu and Grasimov replaced. We can't really tell much beyond that. But they actually started driving towards Moscow, and apparently in this whole kerfluffle, uh, they shot down several Russian military helicopters and a Russian military command and control plane. Uh, some of those helicopters are quite expensive, quite advanced models as well, and about 13 pilots were lost. And keep in mind that well into last year, Russia was already suffering from a lack of qualified pilots. And helicopter pilots, it tends to be more difficult to train them than fixed-wing pilots, because helicopters, as I understand, are much more difficult to fly. But anyway, that's another matter. 13 pilots down, not 21 pilots, but 13. 
uh, several expensive military aircraft wiped out. There were like three Mi 8s. Uh, not the tran there was a transport that was down. We don't know how many people were on that. Uh, but these particular Mi 8s are special electronic warfare versions, so they're kind of advanced. And now they're uh, burning in a field somewhere. <laughs> okay, but that that is all we know about. Obviously, both sides in this are putting out contradictory statements. What we do know is that Putin was unavailable to reach when the convoy was making its way towards Moscow. There were preparations to defend Moscow in progress. We actually saw that. Apparently, a fuel base in Voronezh uh, containing aviation fuel was set on fire, and they suspect that may have something to do with trying to keep it from falling into the hands of the Wagner troops. And at some point... Prigozhin kind of gave up. He claimed that he was negotiating with Lukashenko. Part of the story is that Lukashenko was the highest level person that he could get in touch with because nobody could find Putin at the time. Putin did make a statement where he was big mad. Here he is right here. And then sometime after this, Prigozhin basically backed off, said, I don't want to cause any more bloodshed. He made that agreement, supposedly with the mediation of Lukashenko, where he decided to go to Belarus. It's not clear how many people are actually going to go to Belarus. I mean, how many Wagner people. All we know is that Prigozhin most likely is outside the country and probably there if he's not headed there already. Putin, just as I was writing this, released another statement, sort of reiterating what's supposed to go on. Apparently, they are saying that Wagner guys need to sign contracts with the Ministry of Defense so they will no longer have that autonomy, or they go home. So the Russian government, again, the, the hardest thing about making any kind of takes on this is, first of all, it's, it's still an unfolding situation. And second, we are basing everything off the public statements of people who were pathological liars. That means members of the Russian Ministry of Defense, the State Duma, Vladimir Putin, his press secretary, Dmitry Peskov, and of course, Yevgeny Prigozhin himself. So we have no idea who is speaking in good faith, anything like that. But given Putin's most recent statement, it seems they're sort of holding firm. And they're saying that if you weren't involved, and who knows how they're going to determine who was involved or not, but if you weren't involved in this, or you weren't a ringleader or whatever, sign a contract with the Russian Ministry of Defense, or go home, or go to Belarus. And on that note, one last point that we see right now, as far as I've seen, there seems to be strong evidence, again, at the time that I am recording this, strong evidence that Defense Minister Shoigu will remain in that post. So if Prigozhin launched this stunt to get rid of Shoigu and the other enemies, it seems that has failed. Now, beyond all this, I don't really want to make any predictions and I don't want to give you any concrete analysis on what all this means at the moment. And the only reason for that is right now, pretty much all the information we have is coming from official statements of people like Prigozhin, Vladimir Putin, Alexander Lukashenko, and some various Russian politicians and officials, okay? In other words, everything we know is coming from people who are pathological liars who contradict themselves constantly. So I can't tell you something like, okay, here's the deal that Putin offered, and here's what this is gonna mean, because we don't know if Putin is really going to honor that deal at all. We don't know if that was completely for show. All we know at the moment is that he has made different statements that have contradicted each other, which is a pretty common thing for Vladimir Putin. That being said, we can make some broad statements about what all this means. The first thing is that this entire thing is a huge embarrassment. A real country doesn't operate this way. A real military doesn't operate this way. I saw some of the Russia simps, people like Jackson Hinkle and whatnot, were trying to explain this away. And when it was going on, they're all panicking because these people were, in the case of Hinkle, Hinkle was selling t-shirts with Wagner logos on them. Think about that. He's selling t-shirts from an organization that's recognized as an international terrorist organization by the governments of France and the UK. It may be soon recognized as a terrorist organization by the United States government. Look up something called the Harm Act and call your representatives and senators. At the moment, it is recognized as an international criminal organization by the US government. Okay, so he's selling these t-shirts and then suddenly, Daddy Prigozhin is fighting with Daddy Putin, right? And so these guys were just melting down in Twitter spaces. 
not understanding who to support, not understanding what's going on, uh, because these people, uh, you know, not just him, people like David Sachs, Ian Miles Chong, all these people who have rallied to Russia's side, none of them have any experience or background knowledge in Russia whatsoever. They have no military experience, no military background, uh, no regional expertise, no experience at all in Russia or background knowledge of Russian politics. So they had no idea what's going on. And so they were, uh, you know, first of all, panicking and then they're coping and saying like, oh, it's okay, guys. No one was really hurt. Prigozhin agreed to go to Belarus. And it's like 13 pilots are dead. You've lost multiple multiple military aircraft. Prigozhin claimed he had some minor losses as well. And we may never know exactly how many people were killed in this uh, little conflict. But this is just absurd. This is not what a real mil this is not how a real military works. You know, some of these people were coping saying that oh this is Prigozhin's way of uh, you know trying to reorganize the Ministry of Defense and Shoigu and Gerasimov have to go. Putin could just fire them. At any time Putin could fire them. Putin has changed defense ministers before in the past and it didn't require a <laughs> thunder run to Moscow uh, by you know an armed military unit. In fact, Putin actually did sack a minister of defense once because of a scandal. Now, considering that, what bigger scandal could there be than what Shoigu, or I should say, how Shoigu has been running the war? Another piece of absolute dog shit analysis, and I use air quotes with that, is a claim by some, again, people who their understanding of war comes from like Paradox Interactive games or something, or maybe, I don't know, StarCraft II. Uh, but this idea that this was all engineered to get Wagner, like all the Wagner troops, into Belarus, and then they're going to launch another attack at Kiev. Uh, no. I mean, first of all, you don't need to destroy multiple military aircraft and create an embarrassing situation like what happened Friday. You don't need to do that in order to redeploy forces. If anything, that puts more attention on. Now everyone is looking at Wagner going into Belarus potentially, and everyone is going to count how many guys actually go to Belarus and what they do there. If they had just subtly redeployed them, we might not notice that. Uh, there had been a lot of evidence that, so in general, uh, no. This is not some kind of master stroke to outflank Ukraine and make another run at Kyiv. Uh, all the problems that existed for Russia getting to Kyiv the first time are actually even worse now because the Ukrainian military is much more prepared, much better armed, and the border is far more secure. And then there's one last thing that all the simps, or maybe I should call them zimps, because of the Z, Z, to get it, panicking when this was unfolding and... So what they've been saying is like, all these liberals and Ukraine supporters, they said Wagner's bad. But as soon as Wagner turned against Putin, they said Wagner's good and they were rooting for Wagner. No, nobody was rooting for Wagner. Or at least, you know, some rando who doesn't really understand the situation might have thought this was good if they don't know who Wagner is. But none of us want Wagner to live, okay? <laughs> We are more than happy to watch the Russian Armed Forces or the Russian National Guard, Rus Guardia. We are more than happy to watch them mow down as many Wagner guys as possible. I was saying this would be a real boon for any Rus Guardia guys or any conscript or anybody uh, pulled to the capital to defend it because here they can actually defend their land from actual Nazis. Finally. First time since 1941, they should be proud. And then they didn't get the chance. And then there's sort of a corollary to this bullshit non-argument where supposedly all those Western pro-Ukraine analysts and NAFO fellas were celebrating the coup and they were disappointed that didn't work. They were all sure that Prigozhin was going to drive to Moscow and overthrow Putin. First of all, I don't think that was even really his goal. I believe he was trying to make a show of force again in a real country, in a real military. You wouldn't have to do things this way, but this is a basically an organized crime syndicate with a flag. So he was trying to make some kind of gesture. It got out of hand. I do not think this guy seriously had any intention to overthrow Putin. Putin is a personal friend of his. I think the idea was that I, I think he really thought that Putin would take his side almost immediately. And of course that didn't happen. I was surprised that they got as far as they did towards Moscow. But the fact is, I don't really think he had 25,000 loyal people supporting him. And the other thing is that Moscow is very hard to take. 
it's very hard for me to convey to people how sprawling and congested that city is. It's sort of a radial design. It's got highways ringing it, and it's just filled with industrial areas and apartment blocks and, you know, too many cars on its roads. It was never really meant to have that many cars in it. And so Moscow is famous for its traffic jams and everything. And so, yeah, there may have not have been a lot between the Wagner guys and the outskirts of Moscow, but they were preparing checkpoints. They were trying to fortify the city and just how dense that city is. You could really, you know, defend it quite effectively. In fact, uh, you know, when Wagner, if Wagner actually got up there and attempted to fight for it, I think their supply lines would quickly start to show problems and somebody in the Russian military with some minimal competence might be able to come in there and cut off the supply lines or at least hamper them. And like I said, now you're talking about trying to take over the city that has like a registered official population of something like 12 million and more like de facto population somewhere around 15. So yeah, it's it's a huge uh, urban jungle. And I never expected them to be that successful. I don't know anyone who did, but you know, the thing is that some people just uh, don't really understand how any of this works. And some of those people can be on the pro-Ukraine side, but they don't really represent that faction of people who actually know what's going on. And what is more is that they're not the ones with the burden of trying to explain how this is all just a normal thing in a normal country and Putin is a strong leader who knows what he's doing and he's a great statesman who was able to defuse the situation. Absolute nonsense. So the conclusion I would draw from all this, and this is the most important thing, is that this made people look weak. It made Putin look especially weak. It made Prigozhin look weak. Uh, looks like some of Prigozhin's stated demands are not going to be met. And it looks like most likely those Wagner guys are going to lose their autonomy and they have to either sign a contract, go to Belarus, or go home. Even those who sign agreements or those who seem to comply with the government will most likely come under suspicion. You got to understand that Putin's government is a government where they discourage just even protesting. Okay, one of their big gripes about things like Maidan in Ukraine is just this idea of protesting your government. You're not supposed to air your dirty laundry in public like that. What you're supposed to do the proper way to address your government if you're dissatisfied is you make a personal appeal to the president, the dear leader, in a video and like they do in Russia, you know, they say, Vladimir Vladimirovich, uh, we are workers at the Boyarishnik factory in Nizhnezhopinsk and we haven't been paid in three weeks. Uh, you, so you don't make a protest, you're supposed to appeal to the Tsar and Hopefully the Federal Guard Service notices this or the presidential administration. Uh, it's kind of hard to explain, but the Federal Guard Service, actually one of their duties is to actually look for this kind of discontent and try to head it off. And so that's how you're supposed to do things in Russia. You don't get out in the streets and protest. Even if it's a sanctioned protest, you make an appeal to the Tsar because the Tsar is wise and good. And if something is going wrong in your life, it's because there's some corrupt Boyar, in this case, it could be a military officer, it could be Defense Minister Shoigu, and they are uh, screwing around behind the Tsar's back. He doesn't know. He's a great leader, but he has no idea what's going on with any of his subordinates, right? So you have to tell him, you have to inform him, okay? And that is the Russian way. And you see this in these videos from soldiers at the front all the time, okay? So this is a state where they will drag your ass off the street and throw you in a paddy wagon if you are pretending to protest, if you're standing around pretending to hold an invisible sign. People have been arrested for that, okay? You get fined for that. There are people who want you to believe that it's, it's no big deal that this effective, heavily armed fighting unit, which, by the way, Putin admitted that Russia, the Russian state has been financing. They want you to believe that they can do an armed rebellion and kill pilots, shoot down aircraft, and make a threatening run towards Moscow. But it's, it, it's all over now, right? Because they all said no harm, no foul, right? So it's over, it's okay, state stable, stronger than ever. No, <laughs> like, no, uh, there will be long-term consequences for this. And like I said, the worst part is people looking weak. Putin looking weak, 
Prigozhin looking weak, okay? Because that's the thing about this gangster culture that rules Russia is that if you enter into an agreement with somebody, if they both agreed in good faith, make a deal like, okay, you know, you won't be charged, but you have to go to Belarus and you have to get these guys to sign contracts, but we will remove Shoigu or whatever. Let's say they made like a deal and both of them make a sworn promise, okay? That is seen as weakness. If anything, Putin would probably feel weak about that because he'd feel like, especially after that statement that he made when the thing broke out, where he was very hard and talking about how this would be punished, he would feel that he backed down. And in fact, in a sense, I think he still does, uh, which explains his later statements. But the thing is, he would feel like he backed down because he let a guy intimidate him into this deal. And the thing is that making a deal like this in that particular aspect, uh, that particular sphere of Russian culture is seen as a dishonorable and weak thing, okay? It's all about dominance, all right? So if Putin feels weak, he's going to feel like he has to show he's strong again, which is not going to be very good for Mr. Prigozhin or anybody seen as loyal to him. On the other hand, Prigozhin is very much well-loved by his troops, uh, many of whom are actually well-trained. They're not all prisoners, okay? There is a core of Wagner guys who are pretty much some of the best troops that Russia can actually muster, uh, especially at this point when they've lost so many. These guys uh, really adore their leader, and some of them, I think, were willing to go along with this because they believed in their leader's ability to force his demands. They believed they were doing it for a reason. And when they stopped, presumably on Prigozhin's orders, I believe they did this with the understanding that Prigozhin told them that he secured a deal, and that he secured the demands. And that would have been initially enough to satisfy them. However, like I said, it's just like a day later, or maybe a little after that, that it becomes clear that Shoigu is most likely not going that Prigozhin's got to go to Belarus, that they are going to be told to sign contracts, which is something they initially did not want to do. And so, in other words, they got suckered, and they're not going to like this. And the guys who sign contracts are going to get integrated into the regular Russian military, and they're going to have guns and access to weapons. But it gets even better, okay? So these guys are going to be in the military, and they may be plotting. They're going to want to show strength. They're going to want to maybe get revenge, okay? But even if they don't, the Russian security services and the Ministry of Defense will naturally suspect that some of these guys want to do that. So basically what I'm saying is that you got a lot of paranoid people here who do not trust each other. Now they trust each other even less. Meanwhile, Ukrainian forces continue to make gains all along the lines in Ukraine and the Dnipro and the south around Bakhmut. So all of this is happening against that background. Wonderful. So again, uh, it is too early to say exactly what the consequences of what this will be. But if you understand Russian culture, especially the culture that dominates the leadership or their worldview, then it's clear that there will be long term consequences to this and they will not be pretty. They may not lead to the collapse of Russia, or at least not the imminent collapse of Russia, but they will certainly, I think, at some point be a contributing factor. And of course, the main beneficiary of all of this is Ukraine. So, you know, all the better. All right, one quick update while I was working on this. General Sergei Surovikin was arrested in Moscow. Surovikin was originally at the beginning of the full-scale invasion. He was the commander of the Russian forces in the south. He was the guy who swore they would never give up Kherson. How'd that work out, buddy? But later in October of last year, Sorovikin was made commander of all Russian invasion forces in Ukraine. And just pay attention to these reactions from various Russia simps online, just so you can get an idea of how informed and realistic these people are. Because this guy, they called him General Armageddon, and he was supposed to take them back to the gates of Kiev in February 2023. Yeah, yeah, it didn't work out too well. Didn't really get results. But anyway, he is apparently detained. Charges are not clear, but just in case you're wondering what side this guy is on, he's known to be very close to Wagner and Prigozhin, and he is actually made an honorary member of Wagner. So this arrest is kind of another strike against Wagner. Also, at the time I'm recording this, it appears that Sergei Shoigu is still the Minister of Defense. So we'll just see what happens from there. All right. Well, I thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. 
and uh, I will catch you next time. I ask you to like, share, and subscribe, and also check out the description below for my Patreon link. And yeah, just keep popcorn handy because lots of interesting things are happening over there.